had been a lumberjack in the local area for seven years. Every day his work was peaceful and without incident, if you disregard his encounters with wild animals. But one day something completely unbelievable happened. Fred, whenever he was using his chainsaw, was completely oblivious to any other sound, but this noise was so powerful that it could be heard over the chainsaw's roar. Fred was stunned. He was working on a narrow slope, where machinery was rarely operated. His curiosity overcame him, and Fred went off to find where the noise had come from. As expected, the trees in the place where the noise had come from had begun to fall. Among the felled trees were two California redwoods, each a thousand years old. This piqued Fred's interest all the more. Whatever had felled such big trees on such a narrow slope had to be something quite special. Over the tops of the trees, he could make out sparks and strange rays of red light. Had technology really progressed so far that they could now cut down trees with lasers? But in fact, it was all much more bizarre than Fred could have imagined. At the top of the slope were two giant combat vehicles with laser cannons. Upon closer inspection, Fred noticed that instead of wheels, the vehicles had mobile legs. And above the cannon, something else similar to a robot's head would pop up periodically. The cannons were aimed at a small group of miniature robots below. There were about 20 of them, all identical. Blue rays of light came out of the arms of each miniature robot. They cut trees in half with the slightest bit of contact. But the bigger robot's armor was impenetrable to the rays. The miniature robots, for this reason, endured losses. From below, new robots rose up, but the red laser beams obliterated them far more quickly. The miniature robots were blasted into parts all across the forest. Among them was one robot without an arm. The same robot was struck by another blast, and its head came to a rest at Fred's feet, behind the fallen redwood where he now hid. Out of curiosity, the lumberjack picked the head up, thinking the robot was no longer functional. But the head began to actively move where its body had once been attached. Then the head emitted the phrase, Broadcast alert, recovery failed. Initiate retreat and seek reinforcements. Alert, alert. At that moment, Fred lifted his head and saw a huge cannon aimed straight at him. No one ever saw Fred again. Those sentences which the robots had uttered will be heard by members of the SCP Foundation for years to come. It's practically the only phrase the object can say, although there are a few rare cases of other utterances. The anomalous robot part was assigned the number SCP-1167. Its main part appears to be a control unit. Between the control unit and a flat base, there's also a spherical lever, which seemingly functioned as a neck. The object used the lever for movement. The overall height of the anomaly is 20 centimeters. The source of its electrical energy is still unknown, although it's very powerful. It's never been necessary to recharge the object's contents. It's truly remarkable that when situated in a location with insufficient lighting and a low quantity of oxygen, the object becomes more passive. Evidently, it runs on solar energy and makes chemical compounds from the air. This robot was discovered by a group of spelunkers in a cave not far from the forest where Fred disappeared. A different search party who had combed the surrounding area in search of Fred found no artifacts, or they helped themselves to what there was. The spelunkers handed the object that they found over to the local authorities, after which the Foundation came to know of it. The authorities of the Foundation decided to set up a separate containment zone right where the object was discovered. The area was catalogued as Site 1167-1. The Foundation's archives don't indicate why such a decision was made, but in all likelihood it was due to the object's dangerous properties. While the robot head is contained on site in Site 1167-1, its attempts at escape have not been hazardous to the health and lives of employees. Usually if the anomaly is left without supervision, it attempts to leave the location and adheres to a strict trajectory. Wherever the object is located, it's always found moving to a destination with a latitude of 23.56 degrees south and a longitude of 68.16 degrees west. Deviation from its path occurs exclusively to circumvent obstacles. If the robot head is contained outside of Site 1167-1, the anomaly demonstrates aggressive behavior and becomes more dangerous. In such circumstances, it reveals hidden abilities which were inactive while located in Site 1167-1. The robot head emits low-frequency sounds, causing intracranial aneurysms in all people located within a 25-meter radius of the object. Before this ability was discovered, 14 Class D personnel, 7 engineers, 4 guards, and 3 agents were killed. 
Due to the object's incessant attempts to reach the aforementioned location, the decision was taken to allow SCP-1167 to travel to the area. The area is in Chile, next to the Monteraqui Crater. A research team who arrived in the given region allowed SCP-1167 to walk 100 meters into the territory. No more of the anomaly's abilities were uncovered in the area, although the robot head did produce a phrase different from the sentences it regularly repeated. The object said that its scan was complete, but there was no transport, and the research team had to wait for reinforcements. For this reason, a new zone was established in the given area, Site 1167-2. It was necessary to study the local area in detail for anomalous properties and also to excavate, both of which amounted to little success. Three new objects were discovered in the cordoned off area, which compelled the robot to utter three more new phrases. One of the objects was a mechanical arm which seemed to belong to SCP-1167. When the robot saw the arm, it said that its lost element had been found and it was necessary to preserve it for future repairs. The Foundation assigned the arm the number SCP-1167-1. The two remaining objects, although they were related to the anomaly, were not part of its structure. SCP-1167-2 is an unusual scar of rock in the area. 8 meters deep and 1 meter wide, it stretches 150 meters. The robot had commented on how it was the result of an unsuccessfully modified weapon. It's likely that the weapon that caused the scar was built for splitting rock but its attempts were unsuccessful. It's possible that the robot's creators were interested in acquiring the minerals that lay beneath the thick layer of stone. Or it may simply have been to test the weapon's ability to destroy other robots, since the material the enemy uses is of similar strength to the rock face of the cliff. In accordance with this hypothesis, a third anomalous object may be introduced. SCP-1167-3 is a broken control unit. Analogous to SCP-1167 Zone Unit, the object identified the unit as the remains of the leader of a subunit. The anomaly also added that their objective had not been met, so it was necessary to begin the retreat. Only it wasn't clear whose subdivision the leader belonged to. Whether he belonged to the robot's own regiment or the enemy's was impossible to clarify. Whether they had failed in their objective due to the loss of their leader, or if the leader himself was the target was difficult to say with any certainty. However, the robot's reactions in Fred's story tell us one thing for sure. On different parts of the planet, entire battles are being fought in secret with the use of deadly robots. At first, I thought they might be battle drones belonging to the Anomalous Three Moons Initiative organization. The organization has access to advanced drones and other military technology, although there is a fragile peace between the organization and the Foundation. The Foundation is forbidden from taking into their possession any objects belonging to the Initiative. If this condition is violated, war could break out and the world could end. However, the Three Moons Initiative could intentionally be leaving behind the remains of their technology so that they can plant a spy in the Foundation's wall. The robot might be recording everything it sees and sending it to Korbenik, a world beyond the grave where the Initiative is based. But tricking the Foundation is no easy task. The authorities of the Foundation most likely know about the Initiative's attempts at espionage. So they set up two separate zones dedicated to observing only the robot's head and objects affiliated with it. This allows them to outwit the Three Moons Initiative and to avoid giving them access to any information about remaining anomalies. And the story of the robot emitting a fatal low frequency sound were likely invented to divert suspicions. At the heart of the next hypothesis is the claim that two alien civilizations are waging secret battles for dominion over Earth. The peculiarities of the object's speech patterns can be considered proof of this. It always speaks in the language of the person standing next to it, but only if the language has been programmed inside the robot, of course. But that's not all. The anomaly speaks 124 languages, 8 of which are dead and 15 unidentified. A question must then be posed. If the anomaly is man-made, why would it be endowed with knowledge of dead languages? Everything points to the robots being used for battle. So for them, dead languages are nothing but a burden on their functionality. If the equipment had been made by an alien civilization, then it was made because they didn't know enough about Earth's culture. Extraterrestrial programmers simply equipped them with the languages while also indicating what they would encounter on Earth. They did not realize, however, that some of those languages were no longer spoken. As for the 15 unidentified languages, it's most likely inhabitants of other planets who speak them. 
Furthermore, half the alien languages are understood or native to the robot's creators. The remainder are spoken by their direct enemies. This was clear from SCP-1167's reaction. Some of the languages caused it to become very agitated and aggressive. But what do you think? Which of my hypotheses is more likely to be true? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. I'm looking forward to your likes and any new subscribers.